and um, sinus problem and headache. Okay, we will do that question. Okay, just remind me before we dismiss today. Okay. All right, so welcome back everybody to the second lecture on <clears throat> 213, BC 213, the end times. Uh, we're going to. End of ages or times, and end of age or time are the two different expressions in reference to eschatology. So the answer to your question, Elijah, is yes. Right. So uh, what we tried to point out a little earlier is that there are different uh, terminologies or terms like the last day, the last days the day of the Lord, the end of the age, or end of the ages, you know, uh, and all of these different terms are used throughout scripture, both Old and New Testament, in speaking about the last days or the um, about eschatology or the end of time, right? So all of these terms are used, different, different terms. So we just have to get uh, familiar with it, and then we'll have to learn how to uh, interpret it. The point I was trying to get across earlier was, uh, depending on the context, we should, uh, I mean, the usage, the passage where you're reading it, uh, we should, uh, be, from there, we should uh, interpret as to, this is what the writer is talking about, right? So once we have a good understanding of the timeline or the sequence of events, uh, then when we read the scriptures, we will be able to interpret, okay, this is what he's referring to. But the answer to your question is yes, there are different terms like this uh, referring to the uh, end times. Is that okay? So let's go back to reading uh, Matthew 24. We were in Matthew 24 and verse 15. Now, just for us to get, become familiar with some of Daniel's prophecies. Now, next year, in our third year, we're going to study Daniel's prophecies in detail. We're going to read every verse and study it. But just for us to become familiar with Daniel's prophecies so that we understand what Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 15 is talking about. Keep your hand in sorry, what Matthew 24, 15 is talking about. Keep your hand in Matthew 24. Let's just go back to Daniel chapter nine. And could somebody read Daniel chapter nine, verses 23 to 27 for us, please. Daniel chapter nine, 23 to 27. We're gonna come back to Matthew 24, 15, but let's read Matthew, um, Daniel nine, 23 to 27. Somebody could read this whole passage for us, please. Daniel chapter 9, verse 23 to 27. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay, know uh, that uh, let's pause there, Divya. And I just want to make some comments, okay? So this is Gabriel, Angel Gabriel, speaking to Daniel. And he's telling in verse 24, 70 weeks now, uh, we will understand when we study this in detail. Each week represents a seven year period. And we can prove that from scripture. And as we saw, it was also fulfilled that way. So he's saying, Daniel's saying, Daniel, uh, Gabriel is telling Daniel, Daniel, I've, I've come to talk to you about 70 weeks, really a period of 490 years. And this has to do very, if you look at verse 24 very carefully, your people 
and your holy city. That means this 70 weeks or 490 year period has to do with your people, the Jewish people, and your holy city. That means the city of Jerusalem. Okay, so this, pro this passage is very specific about the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. But what Angel Gabriel says, very interesting in verse 24, this 490 years covers this entire period of to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. That's talking about the work of Jesus Christ. He is the one who came and made reconciliation for iniquity. And we will see it as we progress in this passage. The I will read for us. As we progress, you know, he talks about the Messiah. So to make reconciliation for iniquity, that's Jesus Christ. And he says, from there he jumps to the end of time. What is the end of time? To bring in everlasting righteousness. When is everlasting righteousness going to come? It's at the end of time. Right? To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up vision and prophecy. That means to complete or full, fulfill all, all prophecy. And to anoint the most holy place. So the most holy place is talking about the temple. Right? So, you know, it's translated here as to anoint the most holy, which could be interpreted as to anoint Jesus as king. But the actual full translation there, and you might see it in the, you know, in the passage in, in your cross-reference, it's actually talking about to anoint the most holy place, talking about the temple. Right? So, Gabriel is telling Daniel, I've come to talk to you about 490 years, 70 weeks. This has to do with your Jewish people and with Jerusalem. And this period is going to cover the time when there's going to be reconciliation for sin. And it's going to extend all the way till everlasting righteousness is going to be assured, ushered in. And all prophecy is going to be fulfilled. And the most holy place is going to be anointed or put in place. So he's, he's, he's covering this entire period. Okay. It's very, very interesting. Let's go on, please. Verse 25. Sure, Pastor. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. Okay. So he's saying, from the time, and this is something we mentioned earlier in the previous session, from the time the decree is given to go and rebuild Jerusalem till Messiah will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So seven plus 62 is 69. 69 weeks, a total of 483 years. Right? So the command will be given to go and rebuild Jerusalem. And Gabriel is saying, the street will be built and the wall will be built even in difficult times, which is what happened. When you read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, um, you know, the city was rebuilt, the walls were rebuilt, but it was difficult. In difficult times, it was rebuilt. You know, there was a lot of opposition, but it was rebuilt. And from the de time this decrease issued to the time of the Messiah, that is Jesus, 483 years. And remember, Jesus is the one who's come to make reconciliation for iniquity. Okay, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war, dissolutions are determined. Mm, thank you. So after the 62 weeks, that means 7 plus 62, that is 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Messiah will be killed. 
Now, Daniel didn't understand all of this, uh, but he's, this is what Gabriel is telling Daniel, Messiah will be cut off, Messiah will be killed. And the people of the prince who is to come, that means there's going to be a ruler, and the people of that ruler, they will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's exactly what happened. The city of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed AD 70. Messiah was killed AD 30 or AD 33, some AD 30. Messiah was killed, Jesus was killed. 40 years later, AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman Emperor, uh, General Titus. So the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Right? Till, and, and the end of it will be with a flood. It was devastating. Till the end of war, of the war desolations. That means till the end, there, there's going to be a lot of desolations happening things happening over and over again in and around Israel. Things are, there's going to be a lot of desolations happening. Okay, so he's saying, Messiah will be killed, temple will be destroyed, and then there's going to be an ongoing time of trouble. Then, what will happen? Verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So, now verse 27, he's actually talking about the Antichrist. But Gabriel calls this Antichrist one who makes desolate. Okay. On the wing of abominations, that means he is coming and like he is like riding upon abominations. He's, he's going to do things that are detestable before God. Right. And he's going to make desolate. So this is who Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24, 15, which we just read. Jesus is referring to this verse, Daniel 9, 27. So what is Gabriel telling? He's saying, then, that means after this period of time when desolations are happening, all kinds of things are happening to the Jewish people, then, this man who makes desolate, or as he is referred to him as the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That means he is going to usher in this one week, the 70th week of Daniel. One week representing seven years. He is going to confirm a covenant. So in modern language, we will call it a peace treaty. He's going he's gonna to set up uh, a covenant for a seven-year period. So that's how this man is going to come into power. A seven-year. This is Daniel's 70th week because... If you look back on verse 25 and 26, he's covered 7 plus 62, 69 weeks he's covered. Then he's left a gap. And then he's talking about the last week in verse 27, one week. That's Daniel's 70th week. This man is will come and set up the seven-year covenant or treaty. But in the middle of the week, which is in the middle of seven years, which is three and a half years, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So this is why we say there has to be a temple because he's going to abruptly stop sacrifice and offerings. And you can read, you know, there are more details in preceding chapters in chapter 11 
as well about these things. We are just looking at one passage. Okay. And he is going to come and do so many abominations. He's going to make desolate until the consummation is poured out on this person who makes things desolate. That means the final judgment will be poured out on him. Okay. So now we go back to Matthew 24, 15. Because Jesus is quoting Daniel 9.27 and says, hey, when you see the abomination, this is verse 15, Matthew 24, when you see the abomination, that means he's already gotten into that seven last seven year period, into that 70th week of Daniel. That's why I was saying earlier, there is a transition there in verse 15 of Matthew 24. Till verse 14, he's talking about things happening globally, but suddenly in verse 15, he's zeroing in on the Jewish people. That means he's talking about what, you know, Daniel chapter 9, what we just read. Is this all clear so far? Everybody with me so far? Yeah. So I see uh, Elisha's question. Put an end to sacrifice and offering. That means, uh, you know, in the temple, that in the in the Jewish temple, right? They would be doing sacrifice and offering, and he will come and uh, that means they'll be worshiping Yahweh God by sacrifice and offering. So part of his peace, his covenant, his peace thing is, you know, obviously, he will bring in peace to the Middle East by creating a place where the Jews will be able to put do sacrifice and offering, right? So that's why we talk about the third temple being in place. But he will start off like that, but in the middle of the seven years, he will come and say, stop it. Don't continue. So that's what Daniel is, uh, Gabriel is referring to, saying he will tell them to stop offering sacrifices. And when we look further later on in Revelation 13, you will see that actually the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple and says, you worship me. So he's going to tell the Jewish people, don't offer sacrifices, but I am going to be God. You have to worship me. I know that's what the Antichrist wants. He wants people to worship the devil through him. Okay. So that's what he's referring to. Elisha, you understood that? Uh, do you need further explanation? You got it? Okay. So the question Elisha is asking is the Jewish temple is never placed under con contention between Jews and Islam. So how can we find fulfillment of this prophecy? That's a good question. So that's why we are saying because that whole temple mount is a place of dispute and that's the cause of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of fighting, between, um, contention between the Arabs and the Jews. This man is going to find a peace solution to it. That's why he's going to establish a covenant, a peace treaty. And in the peace treaty, the Jews are going to be able to offer sacrifices and offerings. So right now, that's what the whole problem is about, right? Uh, the Jews are saying, hey, that's our space, but there's a mosque uh, and there's a there's a dome of the, there's a dome over there. Uh, the Arabs are in control. The Jews are not happy about it. But this man is going to be able to bring about a peace treaty that will give permission to the Jews to have their sacrifices restarted. So that's what we are saying. There are, there's going to be this third temple somehow. How, where, and exactly how it's going to be built, we don't know. But it's going to happen, and it's going to come into place. And what's your follow-up question, Elisha? So that is that is what I, I asked with the temple and the contention. So I am mm -hmm. satisfied with your response now. Thank okay. You. Thank you. All right, Devia, what's your question, please? Uh, Pastor, I was just trying to understand Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, uh, where... Uh, uh, that 62 weeks and 69 weeks, uh, like the 69 weeks have been fulfilled. 
so i was trying to understand where the seven weeks had been fulfilled i didn't get it okay so what we were saying is see in 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 verse 25 daniel 9 25 he says seven plus 62 that is 16 weeks he said uh, from the time king cyrus issues a decree to go rebuild jerusalem till the messiah 69 weeks so that is 483 years is over then there is no more counting of weeks it's just that you know verse 26 comes into play that the messiah is going to die is going to be killed uh, the city is going to be destroyed the sanctuary is going to be destroyed which all happened and then there's going to be a time of war and desolation so it's going to be a time of trouble basically so that whole period of time is not counted in that 70 weeks so there's one seven week period that is still pending and that seven week he references in verse 27 he brings that up he says and so that is after this whole time of war and desolation that's going on then there's going to be this man who is going to come in and put in a peace treaty for seven weeks. Uh, the one week, that is the 70th week. So that's where the 70th week comes in. So there's actually a time gap between the 69 weeks, which bring us all the way till Jesus is crucified, to the last week the 70th week there's a time gap you got it okay so the 69th week uh the 69th week is still when jesus was crucified yes is that right okay yes so 69 weeks took place from the time of king cyrus till jesus was crucified 69 weeks is over okay okay right okay then there is time for war and desolation then the last 70th week comes in okay so this time gap between daniel 69th week and daniel 70th week is what we refer to as a church age that's the time god is dealing with the church because from the crucifying of the messiah till the antichrist comes into the church the church is in, so that's why it doesn't have to do with the jewish people church age then comes daniel 9 27 this man confirms a covenant for one week okay, okay. thank you pastor i have one more question can i ask go ahead go ahead yeah so uh this word abomination uh is it like whatever is holy to god is being made unholy is that abomination yeah so an abomination okay. means anything that is displeasing to god so this man is going to be riding on the wing of abominations that means he's going to be such a a man who's going to be like doing a whole lot of things that are displeasing to god and you know we will read i mean if when we read daniel um seven uh daniel 7 daniel 8 daniel 11 and then revelation 13 he, and also paul wrote about it in second thessalonians chapter 2 and all these places basically this man is going to speak blasphemous words against the most high you know and he's going to set himself up as god to be worshipped okay okay thank you thank you pastor uh, we're not getting into all those details. We will maybe when we look at the timeline, uh, we will you know reference the scriptures. Okay, one more question from Elijah: Will this man referenced in verse twenty-seven be a political figure or religious person? Okay, so to answer your question, Elijah, what we see in Revelation thirteen, there are three actors. There is the beast, there is the false prophet, and there is the beast of the Antichrist, there is the false prophet, and then there is Satan, the dragon. 
So these three people are acting together. So this man, the Antichrist himself, come as a political figure because he is going to be able to set up a covenant with the people. And in Revelation 13, you find that this man, the beast, the Antichrist, is going to also influence the financial system because no man will be able to buy and sell unless they have the mark of the beast. So this is Revelation 13. But he is going to be helped by another person who is referred to as the false prophet. The false prophet, as we will see in Revelation 13 and also in Revelation 18, he is a religious person, religious leader. Because he is his whole objective is he's going to perform signs and wonders. The, 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 the beast will also do you know, amazing things, but this man will also do signs and wonders. And his goal is to get people to worship the Antichrist, the beast. And empowering both of them is the dragon, that is the devil. He's empowering both of them. Got it? And this is clearly explained for us in Revelation 13. Okay, so there's that's why we talk about a political system that influences the financial system and also a religious system, all working together, trying to control people. Ultimate goal is to get them to worship the Antichrist, the devil through the Antichrist. Right? So, yeah, so say he. Put that there, Satan, Antichrist, and false prophet, unholy trinity. Okay, all right. That's all. That was a little deviation, but it's become a very long deviation. <laughs> I didn't mean for it to become so long. Okay, Christopher, go ahead. I just wanted us to explain the background to Matthew twenty four fifteen. But anyway, go ahead, Christopher. Uh, yes, Pastor. I just wanted to uh, clarify regarding uh, this point you had raised about uh, you know the. The Antichrist uh, uh, brokering this uh, this peace treaty. Um, there was some. Uh, I'm not sure where I where where I got the reference from, but uh, uh, the point was that was raised was about um, the temple being uh, taken over uh, by, by by the Jews, um, in a sense by force. And um, they would, uh, you know, worship in the temple, and then uh, subsequently uh, this peace treaty uh, would be uh, would be uh, you know brokered by the uh, by the antichrist. So I just wanted to understand if that if that sort of um, is sort of consistent with what, uh, or is there any value in that particular uh, uh, you know uh, that, mm. that point of view basically. Okay, so the answer to that would be the Bible doesn't tell us specifically how this covenant of peace is going to be established. The Bible doesn't tell us. What we can, and what the scriptures do make it clear is there is a covenant of peace for seven years. There is a temple. There is a resumption of sacrifices and offerings, but it doesn't tell us the details, like, or the Jews, you know, like exactly like what you said, that the Jews may take the temple, may, you know, put, the, put up the temple by force and start their thing, and then this man comes in and sets up peace. Those details are not given to us. So our response to uh, such a suggestion would be possible, maybe but we cannot state it for sure. It may have a way, or it could happen in a different way. But what we are certain of is there is this Antichrist. He does set up a seven-year peace treaty. There is the temple where sacrifices and offerings are resumed. Those things we are certain of. The exact way in which this, you know, this treaty is going to be executed, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, so it is. It, this peace treaty is for seven years, is it? Uh, yes. All right. 
this, this, this number seven seems to be uh, <laughs> occurring quite often. Uh, this is all before the tribulation, right? Um, so the seven years is the tribulation period, the seven years of tribulation. I'm sorry, uh, Pastor, I didn't get that. Uh, the, the, the seven years will be the seven years of tribulation. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, got it. OK. All right, so that was a little excursion on the side. Hope you enjoyed the picnic. Now we get back to the main thing. That's Matthew 24. We're going to pick up in verse 15. Uh, I was trying to explain, you know, what Jesus was referring to in Matt, in Daniel. So there's this transition. So let's read on from Matthew 24, verse 15. Can somebody please start with verse 15 again? You know, two verses each or three verses each. Uh, let's go through it quickly. Therefore, when you see the abomination of the dissolution, spoken, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, let's go on. Let the one who is on the house top not go down to take what is in the house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, okay. for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that. Your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, but then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, and never will be. All right, verse 22. And if those days of tribulation had not been cut short, no human life would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear, and they will provide great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Mm. All right, thank you. Let's pause here. What I want to say is this. Right? What we said is in, in verse 15, there's a transition, there's a shift. Till verse 14, it's talking about everybody. Verse 15 onwards, there's a focus in on Jerusalem. Why? Because that seven year period is a focus on the Jews and Jerusalem, which we saw from Daniel chapter nine. So you'll also find in Jesus speaking, is specifically talking about Judea, saying, look, I'm, you know, when you see the abomination, then those who are in Judea, you know, in other words, he's speaking very specifically about that area, because we see that that seven year period is a time of great tribulation, and the Antichrist is going to go out all out against the Jewish people, especially in the second half of the seven year period. You will see that in Revelation 12, uh, he's gonna go out against the Jewish people. And so that's why he's talking about Judea. And if you're in Judea, don't do these things. You won't, you won't be able to do it. The, 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 the attack against the Jewish people will be so intense. You can't even come down from your house top to the, from the rooftop to down uh, to the floor below. It's gonna be so dangerous, you know. You can't even uh, uh, go to get your clothes from the field. It's going to be so dangerous, right? And uh, and he says in verse 21, there will be great tribulation. So the seven years is tribulation. The second half of the tribulation is called great tribulation. We will see that again later on, okay? It's a time of Jacob's trouble. The Bible talks about that, okay? So we talk about seven years of tribulation, but that's three and a half years. The second half is going to be time of great tribulation. So 
So Jesus is talking about these things. And again, in verse 22, he's talking about the elect's sake. The elect is referring to the Jewish people. Right? For their sake, the time will be shortened. So God will come in and intervene. Right? But what I want to point out is from verse 15 onwards, the, the focus has shifted on the tribulation, the great tribulation, what is happening directly with the Jewish people. And there's going to be false Christs and false prophets, like we said, and we can see that, uh, as we mentioned, you know, they, they will, these people will be attempting to get everybody to worship the Antichrist you know, and, and doing all these things, signs and wonders and so on. And, and uh, people, there will be this heightened thing of, on the coming of the Lord. Because now everybody understands, hey, prophecy is being fulfilled. The only hope is that Jesus Christ has to come back. And so verse 26, you know, if they tell you, look here, look for, you know, Jesus is here. Or Jesus is there. He says, don't believe it because the coming of the Son of Man is going to be so powerful. Verse 27, this is the end of the great tribulation. Okay, now we're coming to the end of the great tribulation. That's what he's referring to. His coming of the Son of Man is going to be so powerful. It's like the lightning from the east to the west. And that wraps up there with the end of the great tribulation. It's the, with the battle of Armageddon and all of that, right? So Jesus is speaking about this entire timeline. He's talking about verses uh, 4 to 14 are all the things leading up to the tribulation. All these signs are happening, and they're going to happen in increasing measure. And the gospel is being preached throughout the world. There is intensity of persecution against the Christians. So all this is happening, verses 4 to 14, before the tribulation. Verses 15 to 27 or, or 28 is this, this period of tribulation, the seven years, okay, with the intensity increasing in the latter half of the seven years, right? And then I, I'm just kind of going a little fast here because uh, we take, uh, we're running out of time. And verse 29, he says, after the tribulation, those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall. And so you find those same signs about the sun being dark and moon and every, all those catastrophic or cataclysmic events with, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, the planetary bodies and so on, you find that actually in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, Revelation 8, verse 12, during the tribulation, these things are happening. So we can map what Jesus is saying in Matthew 24, 29 to the whole tribulation period. And after all those things, then verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. All the tribes of the earth will see, they'll mourn. The Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. That's Revelation 19. When the Son of Man comes with all the angels, and he will send his angels, verse 31, and uh, the trumpet will sound. They'll gather together the elect from the four winds. So that's Revelation 19. Okay, so basically, Matthew 24 15 to 31, Matthew 24, 15 to 31 can be mapped with Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, all the way to the end of verse chapter 19. It's the entire tribulation period. Matthew, let me repeat that again. Matthew 24. 15 to 31. You map it with Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, till the end of Revelation 19. That's Revelation uh, chapter 19, verse 21. You all with me so far? Okay. Say your question, please. Yes, thank you, Pastor. Um, so you said um, from we can map it to you, you gave the mapping basically. I think my question basically is what did Jesus now mean by um, in verse 19 when he says, How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing with mothers in those days? And pray yeah. that your flight will not be in winter 
upon Sabbath, uh, for there will be greater anguish than any time since the world begun, and mm. it will never be so again. I just want clarity on that, on those verses, sir. Yeah. So, what will happen during the tribulation, especially the second half of the tribulation, that means the latter half of three and a half years, there'll be an intense attack against the Jewish people. You read about this in Revelation chapter 12, and I'll just give you the reference um, to see how intense it's going to be. You know, uh, Revelation 12, uh, uh, it says, you know, okay, Satan knows his time is short. Revelation 12, 12, his time is short. Uh, and Revelation 12, verse 13, it says, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. The woman here represents Israel. So the dragon, that is Satan, is going after the nation of Israel. Verse 14, Revelation 12, 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So what is time? That's one times, that's two and half a time. That is three and a half. So for three and a half years, Satan is going to go after Israel as a nation. But God is going to somehow preserve the people, right? Going to protect the people. But the point is this, that, um, again, I'm, I'm skipping to verse 17 of Revelation 12. And the dragon was aged with the woman, woman is Israel. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. So he's going after the Jewish people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And many of them will turn to Christ as well. But Revelation 12 gives us a clear picture of what's going to happen during the second half, the time, times and half a time, three and a half years of the great, of the tribulation. Satan is, there's going to be tremendous attack against the Jewish people. And that is what Jesus is referring to here in Matthew 24, verses 15 onwards. So he says, look, the time, uh, you know, it's going to be so difficult. Verse 16, Matthew 24, he says, if you're in Judea, if you're in that area, Judea means the whole district around Jerusalem. He says, you run to the mount. If you're, you don't even come down from your housetop to take your clothing. Verse 17, don't even go to the field to take your clothes. And it's going to be really sad if you are pregnant because how are you going to escape? You know, how are you going to run? And then, Verse 20, uh, don't, you know, hope that you don't have to run during winter. I mean, it's going to be really difficult if you have to flee during winter or on the Sabbath, because Sabbath day means you cannot use any means of transportation. They only walk. So imagine if you have to run for your life on the Sabbath, you can't use your car. You can't get on the, I mean, you can't use any, typically a proper Jew would not use any of these means of transportation. They just only walk. And imagine if you had to flee for your life on the Sabbath. So that's what he's referring to. Because verse 21, there'll be such great tribulation. You got it? Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, it's clear now. It's very clear. Thank yeah. you. All right. One last question from Divya, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I was, uh, uh, as we're reading this Matthew 24, is it in a chronological order? That is one question. And... Uh, in this portion, as you mentioned in verses 30 and 31, yeah, um, so uh, that refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ, correct? Mm -hmm. So where is rapture? Where is the secret coming? Mm -hmm. that so that, that, that will happen between verse 14 and 15. So that we are going to establish uh, a little later on, right? So because till verse 14, it's about the gospel being preached to the nation. So we have to be around to do that work. But once verse, that gospel has been preached to the nations, it's verse 14, the focus shifts now to the Jewish people. So something has changed. So between verse 14 and 15, the church is taken out of the way that we will establish later. Okay. 
But what I wanted just to understand is this in Matthew 24, verse 4 to 14 is the period leading up to the tribulation. The church is still around. The gospel is being preached. The church is being persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 15 to 31 is the seven year tribulation, which maps to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 to Revelation 19, 21. So Revelation 19, 21 ends with Jesus coming in at the end of the tribulation and establishing his kingdom. Now, the rest of Matthew 24 is an exhortation for all of us to be ready, right? To, you know, to be, you know, to be alert, to be ready. And if you're not, we we don't have time to read it. But uh, he, he says, you know, be ready. For, you don't know when the coming of the Son of Man is, right? It's a, it's a, it's a thing. And then he continues this in chapter 25. Also, he talks about, you know, the virgins being ready. He talks about being stewards, you know, uh, talents, use your talents wisely and so on. But uh, it's the exhortation to be faithful, right? But if you understand this whole, in Matthew chapter 24, 4 to 14, prior to tribulation, 15 to 31, the tribulation period, uh, uh, that's, that's a clear picture then what we will do, uh, I was hoping to get to it today, but I guess we will do it next week, is um, the next chapter is to get a little understanding of the geography or the regions involved. So what we will see next week is, of course, we understand Israel. We understand that it is surrounded all by Arab nations. But we will also understand that Daniel spoke about world empires all the way to the Roman Empire. And then he spoke about another loosely held, held amalgamation or a group of 10 leaders who used to belong to the Roman, former Roman Empire. So a loosely held grouping of 10 leaders. And he says, in the days of these leaders, God himself will set up his kingdom on the earth. Daniel prophesied that. So this, this region, which is the part of the former Roman Empire, which today forms a major part of the European Union, is of interest to us. Then Daniel also prophesied about the four parts of the Greek Empire, which is Syria, Egypt, um, Syria, Egypt, Turkey, and Greece. And what Daniel said is, out of one of these four areas, the Antichrist will come. So we look carefully at Syria, Egypt, Turkey, and Greece, see what's happening. Because Daniel foretold that from one of the four divisions of the Greek empire, the Antichrist will come. And we know historically, the Greek empire was divided into what is today as parts of, parts of Greece, Syria, Turkey, and Egypt. So we look at these. So what we see is one of a leader emerging from this region, the region of these four areas, would begin to establish an alliance with these 10 leaders who are part of the former Roman Empire, and he will come into prominence. So these areas are very important for us. The Bible also talks about Russia. The Bible also talks about a nation from the east with an army of about 2 billion. So 
that most likely points to China, a nation from the East with such a large army. So we will just look at all of these geographies. So we say, okay, these are the regions of interest for us now, as far as end time Bible prophecy is concerned. So we just want to be aware of what's happening in these regions. So that will be our next chapter. I've just given you a quick overview. We will cover that next week. And after we do that, we will get into looking at the sequence of events. And that's when we will start talking about, you know, I'll give you an overview of the sequence of events. And then I'll say, you know, why do we say the rapture is going to take place at the end of the church age and before the beginning of the tribulation? What are the reasons? What will happen when the church gets caught up into heaven? What's going to happen in heaven? What's going to be happening on earth? And then we get an overview of book of Revelation to say this is what's going to happen and all of that. Okay, so we will do all that in the weeks to come. Uh, I hope all of you are, uh, you know, following. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, we'll pause here for today. Uh, could somebody uh, close in prayer and dismiss us, please? Pastor. Sir, keep praying. Okay. Yeah. Uh, please pray for me. Oh yes. Okay. We are going to. Oh, thanks for thanks for reminding us. Uh, we're going to pray for Kishin. Uh, pray for uh, his healing. He's got sinus and some other problems. So can somebody uh, lead us in prayer, or um, who wants to lead us in prayer, or? Okay. Let's go. Okay. Um, do you want to pray? Lead us in prayer and pray for Kish. We'll all agree. Yes, Pastor. I'm here. Sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's all pray. Agree together. All right. So let's pray. Precious Father, we thank you for this very moment. We want to say we are grateful for all that you've taught us today. Father, we pray that we are going to be doers of your word and not hearers only. Father, even as you are teaching us about the end times, helping us to be conscious that we should watch and pray and lead others to do what you ought, what we ought to do. Father, we pray for more grace, more wisdom. For your word says that we should walk in wisdom among they that are not. Father, we pray that that will be our life that we will not only take this message for ourselves, but we will teach others in faithfulness, in power, in your grace, that as we all await your coming, Father, we'll be ready. For we know you are preparing a place for us, and so have you asked us to prepare our hearts and mind. Father, for we know that you have told us that before we start preaching the gospel, we should set our hearts and mind on you. This is the kind of people that we want to be. Thank you, Father, for the lectures you've given us. Thank you for the pastors and the mentors you've given us ahead of time to equip us and to guide us in the light. Father, we declare that we walk in the truth of your way, that none of us will walk in darkness, that as we have received this light, we will walk in them. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for Kishan too. Thank you, Abraham. And so, Father, we just pray over Kishan. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke every affliction out of his head and his nasal passages. Uh, we command the sinus problem to leave, every affliction to leave. In the name of Jesus, we command him and decree him whole because he has been healed by the stripes of Jesus. So there be complete wholeness administered to him now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much for being Thank part you, of us. Pastor.